This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by TopTal. Experience a new way of hiring as TopTal delivers only the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team with the very best talent, visit toptal.com slash epicenter. And by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. Uh, my name is Brian Crane. I'm Federica Ernst. I'm Arthur Fold. So, uh, if you can't tell, we're here in the beautiful city of Prague. Uh, the sun's coming down, so we get a couple of minutes of this scenery. Uh, but yeah, so we're here at DEF CON. Uh, just on the last day, actually, they're about the closest place, so we hope they're not going to kick us out while we're recording this. And um, so, uh, Ryan, Federica, and myself uh, from the Epicenter team are here. And fellow podcaster uh, Arthur Falls was uh, roaming around, <laughs> so we got him to just hop on board with us. So it's an absolute pleasure. Happy to have you here with <laughs> us today. Um, yeah, so, you know, the people are sort of making noise over here, we'll ignore them. Hopefully we cut, cut them out. Uh, but yeah, so we wanted to uh, give you sort of a, um, a, a, a you know, a hands-on uh, a podcast episode about DEF CON. It's really fresh uh, in our minds since we're still here. Uh, some of us is, have attended talks, others uh, less. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, hopefully you'll get a good, good overview of how the event went and how things are sort of evolving since last year when we were in Cancun. Um, so I guess the first things we should mention is we had our first meetup here uh, in Prague, right down the hill in a tiny little bar. And yeah, it was great. So what did you think? Yeah, no, it was lots of fun, finally, you know, meeting some, well, I mean, we're often meeting listeners all the time, right? People say, oh, love the podcast, but then doing actually a meetup and getting people coming together and, you know, turning up exactly for that, it's great. You know, one guy uh, was very grateful because he said his lawn is perfectly well mowed and without <laughs> us it wouldn't be, you know, since he, <laughs> he always listens to it, mowing his lawn and uh, no, with lots of really great people. So yeah, it was fun and we should do this more often. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I feel like every time we meet listeners, I'm like, we have the best listeners. Like they're just just nice and humble and they're super appreciative of very what we human. do. Very human. Yes, very they're, human. they're all human. You have human listeners. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How do things work in New Zealand? Do you have a... It's a, yeah, it's a very different scene. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of sheep, maybe? Yeah, actually, that was the 90s. We've moved into dairy. Okay. <laughs> so milk solids now, it's cows. The sheep thing. Yeah, so, I mean, I think we'll, we'll likely be doing more meetups, you know, when we're traveling to events and stuff, so I look forward to for those. Um, and the other thing that is on everyone's mind here is the, um, the parties. Mm. You know, um, what did you think of the parties? I mean, that, that's like why people come here, right? They've been actually really good. It was really weird, the Casper one, because there was this separate, like, VIP section. Oh. It was a bit weird. Okay. Um, but the Casper one was pretty cool. Um, that was last night. Um, ruined myself there. And then the, <laughs> um, the, and what was it before that? RaveCon. Yeah. Which was awesome. The music was pretty intense. Actually, the whole scene was really intense. That was real cool, too. Super grungy, like, you know, underground, weird, like, disused warehouse or concrete and exposed wires. It was cool. Yeah. I, I felt like, I mean, I didn't attend many parties because I was feeling a little sick and tired from, uh, from Web3 the week before. Uh, but I, I felt like it was a lot less VIP-ish. Like, it was much more inclusive than, like, last year in, in Cancun, which was like, like, you really felt like there were these little islands of people going off and doing their own thing, whereas here it was kind of like, you know, much more... Yeah, Cancun was weird. I mean, this is this gets into the difference between um, between the two different events, right? DevCon 3 and DevCon 4. Um, you know, DevCon 3, we were in the middle of the hype, the hype cycle, there was all this money getting thrown around. Um, Dev, DevCon 4 has been a little bit humbler an event, Definitely. I think. And, um, yeah, it's that, uh, that the example of... Um, of how there's how Biddle has become this new thing, where 
um, Hoddle was the uh, <laughs> was the meme of the of the event in, at DevCon three. So yeah, I think it's been amazing, and I suppose the parties were way more inclusive. There was that yeah, it was weird to actually notice that there was was a party with a VIP section, right? Whereas I think in um, Cancun, that was probably more the norm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that like last year we were sort of in the hype. Um, I mean. One one significant difference I think here is that like we haven't seen a single sort of project going around promoting their ICO, um, which was pretty present last year. Um, I mean, although it, I mean, it was kind of like I think coming towards the end of the hype, so there was like a lot less than like the you know, months leading up to it. But like here, it's been really like like you say, it's 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 it's, it's all about biddle. It's all about biddling. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, absolutely. I mean, I don't think ICO, I, I didn't see it mentioned anywhere. There was only one, one thing that sort of, you know, very much reminded me of last year. So if you if you went around Prague, there's these posters everywhere. Uh, and it's like blockchains.com and it's something like, I don't know, the future is ours or some, something. Uh, <laughs> We're, we're done waiting. We're done, done waiting. Yeah. We're done waiting. Yeah. It's so finally if, here. If you look at the website, it's all like, you know, the future must be more democratized, you know, blockchain's changing the world. And it's completely like, you know, vague and nebulous. It doesn't talk about, you know, which blockchain, where, with what, how, you know, no. It's, What's changing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's. Uh, but. I yeah, so that that feels like a little bit this you know sort of remainder of people who somehow you know got a huge amount of money and you know although they're apparently trying to build some kind of city in the desert in Nevada using blockchain obviously yeah, yeah obviously uh, using so, blockchain so maybe I'm wrong and, and it's going to turn into a wonderful place I feel like I want to go on vacation there <laughs> <laughs> what do you think like compared to last year um. I actually like that there were a lot of technical deep dives this year. So I felt like last year there were a lot of projects who gave an overview of what they were going to do. Yeah. Uh, and this year, a lot of projects actually went into way more depth uh, and uh, were very specific about what they had already done and what they had already built and where they were at. Um, I really enjoyed that. It's, uh, it's been a good DEF CON. And I think you and I are probably uh, the ones on this panel that has, have seen the most talks. Um, <laughs> what, what were your favorite talks? Um, I really enjoyed um, Josh Stark's talk. He gave a high-level overview on level two scaling solutions. Yeah, I saw um, that one too. It's great. You, you saw it too. Yeah. So basically, it was uh, it was perfect for technical and non-technical uh, people. So there was something for everyone, and I think it was recorded, and you can actually watch it um, after the fact. And I would, uh, I would recommend it to anyone who is interested in level two at home. Yeah, it was like um, <clears throat> it, it was a good introduction to level two for anyone who sort of like hears this kind of nebulous term level two, and also like compares it to other solutions like off-chain solutions that aren't necessarily level two, and like really kind of frames the thing. I thought it was, it was really nice too. Um, one of the, my favorite talks, um, I really like this um, this uh, parasitic labs uh, talk. Uh, prismatic. Uh, pris <laughs> <laughs> prismatic labs. Uh, pris <laughs> prismatic labs talk. Um, just a few. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. It starts with a piece. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this afternoon, um, and so they're working on an on Ethereum 2.0 uh, client, and I, I apparently have got received a grant from the Ethereum Foundation. Yeah. And uh, are uh, are building this like, really impressive client. Um, so that that's been one of the major topics I think this year is Serenity. Yeah, yeah we're not yeah. calling it ETH 2.0. It's Serenity, and um, and so Vitalik sort of lay, laid out the vision for Serenity at the very top of the conference, um, and uh, and so we saw a lot of that coming in this year. I think like last year, last year you know we, we saw the like sort of beginnings of Casper. There were I felt last year that like I was sort of seeing a lot of dev tools starting to emerge um, so you, you you could like you know build your dApp with um, like if you were you know so sort of, like taking all these different dev tools and putting them together in a stack you kind of could configure your stack to start building a dApp but it was still required quite a bit of work 
I felt that this year we started seeing things kind of like mature, come together. Um, like the Ethereum roadmap is now pretty set, uh, but then also there's like other stacks that are starting to become mature, like the Cosmos SDK will be really soon. You know, Substrate was demonstrated uh, last year, last week at um, at Web three, also here. So like things are kind of like coming together, maturing, and um, I think what I'm looking forward to next year is now like seeing what people will be building with these stacks. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's sort of my takeaway. Yeah, I mean, so following Ethereum, you know, sometimes more closely, sometimes less closely. You know, a few few months ago, maybe it was uh, six months ago, or something like that. Maybe a little bit less, right? They did this big uh, announcement to you know kind of reshuffle completely their you know roadmap. Um, and so, I I think there's been a perception a lot that there's you know really a lack of clarity or direction in Ethereum, and and they keep changing their plans. But then I, I do have the impression, and it have the impression, you know, for example, in this Prismatic Labs talk too, that you know there's a there seems to be more clarity now, and there really are a lot of teams working on it. So I, yeah, I think it, it it feels like they're moving pretty quickly towards having you know finally some kind of scalable Ethereum, which I, I guess. We've been working on for many years, but now it seems it seems like it might actually <laughs> yeah, yeah. come closer. But I guess we'll see, you know. <laughs> but pretty quickly is is I mean it's not that quickly, right? I mean basically they're not even saying it's going to happen next year anymore. It's going to happen twenty twenty for sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and actually I'm a little bit um, shocked that it's taken this long, so far. Um, I no, but because they've been saying 2020, and then I was like, oh, it's probably 2022, <laughs> and now I'm like, watching it, like, maybe it will be 2020, 2021. You know? Yeah, but, but is that good enough? I mean, do I, you think that's good enough, Brian? You know, I have no idea. Uh, I don't think it's very good. I think they should. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's problematic, right? Like. There was a time when this got pitched as an application platform and people started making business decisions around using Ethereum as an application platform. And we they have not actually received the fundamental infrastructure piece they needed to make those businesses a success. That was a scalable blockchain platform. And um, and this is what's led to all these other, um, <laughs> other projects um, spouting up right and I'm, I don't mean to um, shill anything that I'm involved with but like things like uh, NEO in, um, in China and like EOS and, and Tezos all of these um, uh, all of these different protocols are emerging because there's uh, there's been a frustration with uh, the pace of development and people have made business decisions around a decentralized future and people just haven't been confident in, um, yeah. in the Ethereum roadmap and um, I mean, the Ethereum Foundation for 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 someone who's meant to be building basic infrastructure is very decentralized, and a fairly decentralized organization is not always the best at churning out good results quickly. And I think we're seeing that. Yeah, I mean, I think we will see. I mean, I agree with you, right? And I think we'll see in the next year probably a lot. I, I mean, I guess we'll maybe right. So I think Cosmos is probably going to launch in you know maybe January, February. So that's definitely close. Now, okay, first the Cosmos Hub launches, so that's not yet a replacement for Ethereum, right? So until they have then like Ethermint launch, it's probably also going to be like middle of next year until that's there, right? And then Substrate or Polkadot, they're, you know, maybe end of next year, Definity at uh, some point. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I suspect actually probably by the end of next year, maybe there'll be more clarity, right? Maybe we'll have some of the first platforms that, you know, are viable alternatives to Ethereum. And, you know, Ethereum probably also will have a better idea about, you know, how far away they are from from actually delivering, um, you know, Ethereum 2.0. Although that being said, I, I've had the impression that maybe one of you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, plasma chains seem like more feasible. Uh, and that maybe that we'll see already before, so sort of kind of scalable Ethereum side chains. Maybe, but maybe. the no. thing about plasma chains is you've got this challenge period, right? 
and so you need to come up with a decentralized mechanism. It doesn't actually have to be decentralized, but you have have to have some mechanism for. Um, you have to be able to fit that challenge period into your UX, mm -hmm. right? If you want to uh, take tokens or whatever off a of plasma chain, um, and so that's an interesting UX hurdle uh, that hasn't really been tackled. That's like an exotic um, challenge. So that's something I'm a little bit interested to understand about uh, plasma chains. We'll see how that gets solved. Yeah. Did you go to Karl Flarsch's talk? I <laughs> didn't. You didn't. So he actually gave a really succinct description of all the different plasma versions. I don't know whether you can keep track because I, I, I confuse them all the time, like plasma cash, plasma MVP, debit, prime, whatever. Uh, so uh, basically he explained what the exact differences are between all of them and uh, w which challenges they face um, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was a super good talk so um, I, I think that was also recorded so I'm it seems I'm uh, I'm the recommender today <laughs> <laughs> recommender of uh, recorded talks so Karl Flash, go watch it hiring is stressful let's face it it's a long process of sifting through resumes and interviewing candidates without any guarantee of quality. But it doesn't have to be this way. Companies all over the place are experiencing a new way of hiring with TopTal. If you go to their Trustpilot page, you'll see that of the hundreds of people that have left reviews, over 98% were four or five star ratings, including one guy who wants to give his developer a bear hug. That says a lot. TopTal gets all this great feedback because they focus on their clients and their top priority is quality. They only accept the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. One of these engineers is Radek Ostrowski. Radek has experience as a lead software engineer and data scientist for Sony and Expedia. Then he discovered blockchain and he became totally consumed with Ethereum. He worked as a consultant for the firm Start On Chain and his Time Locked app won the top quarter consensus Uport and Identity Blockchain Hackathon. Then he expanded his reach through TopTal. He worked with a bunch of clients on projects such as smart contract development and a POC that leverages blockchain. If you want to hire engineers like Radek for your team, go to toptal.com slash epicenter for a no-risk trial. A TopTal director of engineering will deliver your next hire in as fast as 48 hours, and you'll get a $1,000 credit when you decide to hire. We'd like to thank TopTal for their support of Epicenter. So coming back to the, to the foundation a, a little bit, so uh, this was the first time that we saw uh, Aya Miyaguchi you know, speak in front of in front of DEF CON as the new uh, managing director of the foundation. And at the beginning of the conference, she sort of you know, laid out what the vision was for the foundation moving forward. And um, that, that vision appeared to be one of sort of like mind, more, more mindfulness in the way the foundation grows and the way that the foundation invests its resources, whether that be through grants um, or like you know, hiring people in the foundation. Um, what were your thoughts on sort of like this new direction? I love it. I think uh, I think I is amazing. Like you know, she's um, she's just a super confident manager. I mean, the the foundation did need like strong leadership, and um, and yeah, I mean, it's well, you can see it just in the fact that we've got stuff happening now. I think like you know, the fact that we're seeing like we have a sense of forward progress rather than um, this kind of weird stasis that it's felt like we've been in for so mm. long um yeah so i'm i'm stoked i think she's awesome i also think aya is great um but to me it seems so basically she had this tagline beauty and subtra uh, subtraction yes uh, yeah. so basically um it seems like she wants uh to uh shrink the foundation into basically i think i think that's that's it's I think that in principle is a cool thing. So basically saying the ecosystem has to stand on its own and we want to get the ecosystem to a point where it doesn't really need the foundation for all that many things. I think that's great. I'm just not sure whether we're at that point yet. I so yeah. I think at this point, I think we still need a strong foundation to actually get stuff built. I 100% agree. I think it's, <laughs> I think that, I, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I feel like that the time for that talk would be after exactly. um, Serenity, right? Um, so... I think it's weird, but at the same time, stuff is getting done, so, you know. Yeah, I don't have an opinion on that, except that, you know, for many years, the criticism of the foundation was, no, it is not doing nearly enough, right? Because it has a huge amount of resources, and, you know, Ethereum obviously wasn't, you know, 
performing in the way that people expected that it was promised at the same time you know the ethereum foundation wasn't really funding stuff even a project like uh, the second layer project didn't get funding for like lightning or, or you know can rain in that kind of stuff from the foundation you could have had funding there uh, and now that's changing right and I think you do perceive that there's you know more much more momentum now I mean I one, one thing that I, I think sort of addresses these concerns is uh, the, this uh, this approach that she has like Kaizen like continuous improvement so Whatever the case may be, I feel like it's sort of built into the foundation now that you know there needs to be this continuous improvement and this continuous like putting putting everything back into question, uh, while while at the same time being mindful of like where the foundation invests its resources. Um, I wanted to address uh, maybe th this point further, like sort of the ecosystem not not needing the foundation necessarily to grow, and I, I think like really we're starting to see this. Uh, in the form of sort of all the grants programs that are uh, that we saw sort of appear here, um, so obviously the Ethereum Foundation has its grant program. Like they said, I think twenty million dollars uh, that they've uh, now granted to seventy pro uh, projects. Consensus has its grant program. Gnosis has its grant program. Um, Status, uh, the Ethereum Community Fund. So. There's a lot of money sort of flowing into all of these sort of projects in the ecosystem. Um, maybe this, maybe maybe the, the ecosystem is becoming more decentralized in this way, with like these sort of pillars that are funding all this innovation and all this development. Wouldn't you agree? Hundred percent. Yeah. Oh no, actually, no. I retract <laughs> that. Um, consensus is twelve hundred people now. I think that's like a bit concerning. I think that's like a major point of centralization. Apart from that though, yeah, and it does seem that all of this amazing work in Ethereum is actually being done outside the foundation rather than inside it, which, yeah, I mean, that's, which was always the dream, like, was always to um, have the foundation go away, so, yeah, that's it. The foundation should become a tiny smart contract. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that just dispenses money. <laughs> I mean, one, one uh, yeah, so speaking of consensus, I saw, did anyone see Joe Lubin's talk earlier today? No, no. I, didn't. I mean, it was, it was an interesting talk. Um, I think it may have been the first time I'd actually seen, seen him speak, uh, not like on a panel. Um, but yeah, so he came out and it, it was like, a, I mean, he, he sort of read his talk, he had very much prepared it. Um, but yeah, so he praised you know, the, the, the ecosystem for um, sort of continuously improving itself, like praised obviously like all these consensus folks that are building so many things, like Truffle celebrating its millionth download. Um, and um, sort of like many people, I, I think, uh, around the, sort of the observers of the ecosystem may criticize it for uh, uh, not having produced like the killer app yet. And you know, his vision was that you know, the killer app is like, uh, I think Vitalik uh, said this, like death by a thousand cuts, right? So it's not like one killer app, it's like many small little killer apps that like together, you know, sort of, like take down a centralized you know, hierarchies and centralized systems. Um, so I thought that was like a good- work? How many apps yeah, actually that, work? <laughs> <laughs> Death by a thousand cuts, you've got fun fairs, one. But <laughs> we got. have five, five cuts already, so five, you know, yeah, like yeah, 995 that, more to come. Right. Yeah, that sounds, yeah. that sounds sort of like a euphemistic <laughs> yeah. way of like, uh, of like washing over that there are actually aren't any applications that have like large scale usage interaction. Interesting choice of metaphor as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously this thing's too tight. But, right. but now we but. get to live, so you know, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, I, obviously these things take time and like we're sort of starting to see now, okay, five, five apps is like better than none, I think. Um, <laughs> it is, and that comes in with the whole Biddle thing, I think. I think there's a very different like vibe here of building rather than speculating, which was like, was very Cancun-y. Mm. Uh, yeah, Cancun But I do, th I do think that like, even like, well, Consensus has done a huge amount of positive stuff in the space, it is concerning the sheer size of that organization and influence, right? Um, and I think that gets glossed over a lot in discussions about, um, about the Ethereum community, just the sheer size of Consensus.
And on it seems Instagram to be growth. such a disorganized, decentralized, uh, you know, organization. That, that uh, does it really have this? I mean, you know, if it was really twelve hundred people, like highly organized <laughs> oh, yeah. structure, you know, maybe that would have a tremendous, a tremendous impact or like kind of political influence. But that's not really my impression of consensus. No, neither is mine. But it's just. <laughs> just a lot of people it's a lot of people under a single banner you know and yeah. i also yeah. think the weight of consensus um as opposed to all the other projects combined has gone down so i think consensus was super early uh, to this ecosystem and they ballooned up really fast but if you now look at all the other projects that actually have very decent sized teams i don't think it's it's uh any longer the uh, they're like the lion's share yeah. Of, yeah yeah i see what you're saying yeah yeah, so another thing I wanted to uh, speak about briefly, so it's actually exactly a year ago, uh, or no, it was like the week after DEF CON that Meher and I decided to start working on, you know, Course One. So basically company building like validators, improve state infrastructure. And at the time, we didn't see anyone working on this. Maybe there was like the one protocol guys, you know, later became best that, that had also started. Uh, and then on... I mean, very recently we had the podcast you know, with, with Jake from CoinFund, like a few weeks ago. And then they organized together with like uh, some other fund called Cam Cambial Ventures. This event on Tuesday nights, so I was also speaking on a panel at that event uh, about like, you know, generalized mining. And uh, that was very interesting to see just how that had become in like such a short time such a you know vibrant and it feels like its own little hype subspace uh so the, yeah there was a panel where you know i was on there and then uh, axel from west and then uh, someone from rocket pool and then adrian um from cryptium uh, and after i said the panel with with investors and they're all like oh what does this mean for us how do we deal with this how, how is this going to change and then there some some different protocols were speaking like life beer and new cipher and it was you know completely packed and it was also interesting yeah just how this has in such a short time become such a uh, so much attention on this and so much activity around it yeah i mean so i i think also it, we sort of saw this here where like proof of stake has really become uh like the you know, way moving forward for for network validation and uh I mean, no one's really talking about like you know, ways that we can optimize like proof of work or anything like that. I mean, like it's it's just not even being discussed anywhere. Um, so yeah, I mean, like that that seems to be like where where things are going, and it's it's actually quite encouraging. So, yeah, you know, proof of work was always a bit weird, right? Just the notion of just burning, putting all that effort into just pushing a rock rock up a hill. Um, it was, yeah, it was bizarre. Um, it was funny. I was, I had a panel with um, uh, Eamon Gonsaira on it and he made the comment that like, proof of work, it's like incredible. Like it's this amazing idea. It's really awesome. It's, it's got us to this point, but we really need to develop new, more efficient systems going forward rather than something that consumes um, half a percent of the world's like electricity production. Like are you <laughs> joking? It's like not a good, it's not a like, something to design in the direction of you know yeah, yeah. Carbon, carbon cost and all that but but yeah. when i say something like that i get attacked by like all the big you know yeah. bigger maximus you say it's helping drive the world towards sustainable energy <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> i i don't understand the argument yet although last time i made an argument like that i got bombarded by like you know 40 different things, read this, read this, read this, read this, they all disproved you, and they all proved that Bitcoin is actually good for, uh, you know, making the planet more green <laughs> and sustainable, so. Yeah, keep, <laughs> since, keep. I, since I haven't read all of those things yet, I, I, I have to. <laughs> well, they're out there, right, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, staking tokens, they're also gaining from the other side, right? So basically, uh, a year ago, um, there were a lot of uh, token economics that we as an ecosystem hadn't quite figured out and there were a lot of utility tokens and I feel people are moving more and more away from utility tokens towards staking models. So I think this is also uh, so, so an area where uh, staking is gaining ground. Yeah, you mean utility tokens in sort of these 
application payment tokens. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe you want to talk more about, uh, so during your, your panel, um, there was some discussion with regards to sort of like crypto funds and how they should in fact, like, and I think like on the CoinFund episode it was discussed as well, how they should in fact be, like, have a skin in the game in the networks that they're, uh, that they're investing in and like the role the validators play in that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a bunch of things, right? So first of all, it's just that when you when you create these networks and you want to have certain behaviors in these networks, it kind of makes sense, right? That you compensate for these behaviors by giving tokens. You say, okay, we give away new tokens for things that make the network better and function actually the way it's supposed to function. But of course, once you have that, and then as an investor now, all of us say, oh, but all of these new tokens are given away for performing these network functions. So even if they can buy, you know, some percentage of the initial supply, they're like, oh, if we don't also engage in that, then we get diluted and all of these other have these upsides. So they, I think from that side, there's this sort of, you know, realization, okay, we have to engage in that. And we have, we can't just like initially put some money in and then we, we own a fixed percentage and then we kind of set and we huddle it uh, until the golden the golden rainfall comes <laughs> uh, so there's that and then i think another thing is that investors increasingly try to you know, sort of position themselves as having you know providing extra value in that right they say oh we, we you know we don't just invest in the projects but then we also engage with the network and we're going to run nodes and 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 you know trying to sort of differentiate as investors so i think that that's the second thing uh, second thing that's happening, uh, I, I think another benefit, although I haven't heard that so much as a reason from investors, it's just that I think it will give you a much deeper understanding of these protocols when you actually engage with them in, in a way that you now have to run some infrastructure. Um, and that probably helps you make much much better investment decisions as well. So yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's becoming some kind of trend. Now, personally, I'm still quite skeptical that most funds will do much in that direction. I think they'll maybe do some things, but I think the most part, it's just not their expertise. And they don't have really like developers or maybe they have like one or two people on staff. So some funds are obviously building out more of a you know development team and infrastructure team and, and maybe they'll do it to some extent, but I think many of them will end up having to you know rely on services provided by others. So this is the role that, you know, Companies like Chorus One, I guess, can play in that ecosystem. Um, what, what do you think are like? What, what do you think the future looks like? Of, like synergies between validator, validating services, service providers, and and funds, and like when do those maybe start to merge? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they they certainly are merging to some extent, right? So I think there's various validator companies that say, oh, we're also going to have a fund, or then funds that say, oh, we're also going to run validators, and then there's some like us who like. You know, we don't have any aspirations to run a fund. Because uh, you can always, you can almost kind of see the verticalization already, where you have like a fund that would invest in a validator, and then the validator sort of like also sort of runs the validation for this for that fund, right? Like, sure, yeah. I mean, there's certainly synergies, and you know how exactly organizationally that will work. Whether you know there's some partnership, so it's just a service that's provided, or whether they do both. I think all of those combinations will exist. I mean, generalized mining is also a way of, as, as, as you said, a way of putting people off pure speculation. But then if, if, it's, if it's a service that you can easily outsource to someone else, um, in a way, you're, you, you, you enable speculation again. So I, I think it's probably going to move into a direction where um, you, you can only contribute a very small part. So basically, you will actually have to contribute something else other than holding something or staking something, uh, something that requires more input and more forethought um, or more work in mm -hmm. some way. Um, because otherwise, you can you can now um, in this model you can then buy still a you know a large part of um, the asset that you're talking about. You can just give it to someone else to. Um, to do the generalized mining for you uh, and they will stake it for you or do whatever you actually have to do to not be diluted um, but i think it's going to move in a way where you will actually have to do much more in order to not be diluted because otherwise otherwise um, you will close off the system to newcomers you will discourage new newcomers from actually joining the system and in any system that you actually want to grow um, i don't think you can do that you can't afford to do that yeah i mean i, I... 
I think in terms of like, okay, how much do you have to do to perform these services? I think that there will be huge variance between networks, right? So, okay, there's staking and, and staking may be, you know, it's not as trivial, right? but again, that's also going to vary between networks. But then if you have these, some other things, like maybe you have these token created registries or some, some projects, you know, let's say with Ocean, there's some kind of AI type thing or off-chain computation. So I think there's, a, you know, or, you know, let's say life peer down the line when when there's people you know significant people using it for transcoding then maybe you have this gpu farm operation for transcoding so i think there's going to be a lot a lot of different things that but in the end they just have to get performed for the network i mean that that's really the goal who does it doesn't really matter right provided it's a distributed number it's uh provided the provisioners are distributed yeah and well, even that probably depends on, on the use case, right? So let's say in, in like, for example, like live peer, does it matter that uh, there's many different, that the transcoding services distributed? Maybe not really. In the case, it's like a, a large proof of stake system and that's the consensus and kind of governance. Well, then certainly it matters that it's distributed. Um, and for instance, if you look at curation services, then it does matter that there's a, a higher number of people who are actually partaking in this because otherwise you'll just um, have a very biased curation. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you have something like, you know, I guess prediction markets, right? If you have prediction markets, does it matter that there's like that many parties betting on prediction markets? Not really, right? Because even if you have like just a bunch, uh, the idea is if the prediction's off, then anyone can come in and arbitrage it out, right? So you could even have a small number of players uh, and still have, you know, kind of efficient outcomes. Yeah, I think that works for many for many systems, but I think for, for some systems it's crucial uh, that you actually have a large number of participants. Sure, mm. absolutely, yeah. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise-grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, Check out aka.ms slash Epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. Something else that's interesting. I was reading, and this is not immediately DevCon related, but it comes back to this, um, to this, uh, to the different culture or the different vibe here that has been like really buildy and less, uh, less hypey. Um, and that is um, <clears throat> Union Square Ventures, or maybe actually comment is a commentary on this whole conversation. Uh, published this blog post where they said infrastructure follows applications. Total opposite of the FAT protocol thesis, which they coined, right? Mm. And there's a sense in which, and I don't know, I don't want to like speak for too many people, but it felt like they were just, they just needed something to tell, to say, tell their investors, right? Um, when, they, when they started making crypto investments and the FAT protocol thesis seemed to make sense. But it always seemed a bit weird. And now to see them completely flip-flop on it. And also to notice that, you know, we really don't have the infrastructure yet, but we are seeing these applications begin to emerge. And maybe that is the actual model. Maybe the FAT protocol thesis is always kind of off. Maybe it was always going to be um, maybe a more application-centric focus on like both investment and uh, production was always was always the so, way to so what are these applications that you see emerging funfair uh, maker dharma uh, maker da uh, you know the die uh, dharma um, spank chain had a crack at it um, 
I'm blanking now all of a sudden. You had you had to at least two more. Uh, yeah, I think status. Uh, they even I think they ceremoniously closed their Slack today, and just, uh, all of status is now on status communicating. Yeah. Let's see how that goes. Um, all yeah, good. All good too. Good. I mean, I, I have you tried I, to use it? I have. I have tried to use it. And have you succeeded? <laughs> no, I haven't. No. <laughs> 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 but it's, I mean, it's there, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, 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 so we did uh, the Tezos episode, right, uh, a while ago with Arthur uh, and, and Kathleen. And, you know, Arthur, and, and we talked about that too, right? So, hey, what about scalability? You know, Tezos doesn't scale very well. Like, so w w how is it going to handle, you know, all the taps? And he, and he is sort of was more of the opinion that actually scalability isn't that and, and I don't necessarily agree with him but you know he was of the opinion oh scalability isn't really the bottleneck it's just people haven't actually really designed applications like kind of blockchain applications that people really want to use right and I think I'm not convinced that you know if we had a massive amount of scalability that really the applications would be here at the moment and, and especially the user experience would be here so that you, you would actually get mass usage. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think the price is a big factor. So I think basically if you if you um, look at building applications and you completely disregard gas costs, it gets a lot easier. And I think people were, ha have been having a really hard time actually building applications that don't bankrupt you. So I yeah. think if that, was, if that were a thing that was uh, not necessary anymore, I think we would see a lot more applications live today. Speaking of applications that don't bankrupt you, um, I think maybe, I don't know if you guys have anything to say about this, but I thought that uh, I saw a couple of panels and, and, and talks related to security, uh, and my impression is that we're starting to see a lot more sort of serious, um, more sort of traditional IT security, crypto security, application security people come into this space. So um, Zeppelin did an audit of Solidity 0.5, which was sponsored by the foundation and uh, Augur, I think. And so it's been formally verified. And so in this in this audit, uh, and so it seems to be like a lot more security is coming into, into Solidity. And we're now seeing like a lot more firms like Chill of Bits and also Zeppelin and others um, working to improve security and like building like these massive security teams. Um, so I wonder, maybe you guys have something to to to, to comment on that. Uh, how do you feel that we're doing on the security front? Well, I mean, you know, it's banal to bring up the DAO, right? But um, it's always been if we're going to have these open systems, we have to have. They have to be totally foolproof, right? Like Spank Chain, you know, they publish their contract immediately gets hacked. It's like, what the hell, man? Yeah. You know? Well, actually, they mentioned that in one of the in one of the uh, the panels. And I guess like their answer was, well, there was less money in this contract than it, what it would have cost to get audited. I, I think that's <laughs> which, that's that's, that's a, <laughs> which I mean, is I, I mean <laughs> which is a commentary on the cost of security, right? Sure. Yeah. Getting things audited is enormously expensive, and there aren't actually all that many people who can do this and find the bugs. Uh, but I do, I do think uh, actually moving funds into these systems slowly and kind of increasing the bounty, the real life bounty slowly is kind of a valid way. I, I did feel that uh, it was a little bit after, you know, rationalization after the fact, but um, in this case, but I, I really do see that, uh, that security is a problem and we're not yet good enough at it. Um, I think formal verification is going to be um, one block that is actually adding to this. So basically, uh, uh, first contracts are starting to be formally verified by companies like Runtime Ver Verification, and um, mm. that's a super cool thing. And you guys had your contracts yeah, so formally we, verified. <clears throat> we we had we have a wallet, the Gnosis Safe. It's downloadable now, um, and it's uh, the it's a smart contract based wallet, and it's uh, the only wallet that's fully. Uh, formally verified at this point in time so yeah yeah uh, that was a great talk actually um so maybe yeah you want to maybe tell us a bit more about uh gnosis safe gnosis safe um okay so basically um it it, it has 
a couple of features that uh, so far no wallet has has uh, had. So basically, in principle, you can batch transactions together, which makes interaction with DApps um, a lot easier. Um, in the in the future, you, you will be able to pay um, gas costs in any token you actually have in your wallet, so you won't actually need Ether, so you can pay in the token that you have via relay service um, and it's uh, it's uh, it's a personal multi-sig so it's safer than most of the wallets or all of the wallets that are out there um, because you have a, a number of keys for this wallet and you can um, you by default you actually have to sign twice once in your browser extension once in your mobile so it's wallet. Like a 2FA it's a two, your, exactly. It's a, two, yeah. it's a two of a, and uh, when you lose a key, you can uh, you can add in another key. And we're working <laughs> on um, we're working on social recovery mechanisms where you can have one address that is five of your friends, and if, if four of uh, four of the five of your friends agree that this is really you and you lost your key, uh, you get to nominate one more key into the wallet. So basically, it's it's um, uh, it's a way of making. Uh, making uh, using crypto funds more user-friendly and uh, more fail-proof. Um, yeah. yeah, I thought it was a terrific talk. And I'm, I'm, I was actually looking forward to, I was a little disappointed that Stefan didn't go into more of the social recovery stuff. Uh, but I think like that, that's probably one of the most interesting things. So like um, off of like, if we're not talking about like, technical uh, aspects of crypto like this whole mm -hmm. idea of social recovery and like how we can engineer these systems that allow us to like yeah it's without like, central authorities or like without some kind of like um service or company and being able to recover our keys and yeah there's super interesting ideas in this space so basically even if you say for instance uh, if you claim this is my wallet and i lost my key and then you actually have to put up 10 percent of what's in that wallet and if no one else contests that within a month's time or two months time by using that key in order to actually move the funds uh, you could have a mechanism that actually said okay this is probably Sebastian's wallet because he put up 10% of the funds and if the funds had been moved in this time the 10% would be slashed so um, I think there are ways of, of uh, engineering trustless recovery but it's, it's, it's a UX challenge and I think yeah. a lot of people are working on this Yeah, I actually had a funny experience I tried to reactivate my WeChat account from uh, quite a while ago. I lost my phone, <clears throat> and um, so I lost my phone. I, you know, I I still had the same phone number though, and um, I uh, I forgot the the um, the questions, right? The um, the security questions, and so they said, okay, then go to the social recovery uh, thing. But I'd only ever used it in China, and I like the only person I could actually recognize was Dominic Williams was the only person I actually <laughs> knew on my WeChat phone. <laughs> and so I needed two and I just couldn't find another person. I once tried to create a WeChat account in... <laughs> <laughs> that was so true. Recovery got totally wrong. Like, how can I have 40 people who I don't know? <laughs> I once tried to create a WeChat account in, in Singapore, I think. And I think like to create the account, like I needed to be, you needed like some, someone to vet you and so, like, the only thing I could do is, I was in a hostel, I was just like, look around, like, who might have a WeChat account here? <laughs> well, Chinese tourists. Uh, so, someone uh, was nice enough to, like, let me into the WeChat system. Yeah. It's interesting, eh? WeChat's, like, a really interesting, that's a really interesting platform. Except for the fact that everything is read by the Chinese government. And Ah, it doesn't mean it, make it any less interesting. It actually makes it even more interesting. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. But anyway, that's a, that's a, Diverge, divergent, tangential divergence yeah. <laughs> from so through social recovery, but yeah. So I mean, I, I think maybe we could perhaps mention um, you know last week's Web three summit. Uh, we yeah. were all there as well in Berlin, and it sort of like led up to DevCon. It was a good. It was a good like you know mise en bouche uh, for <laughs> for DevCon. Um, What's a mise en bouche? Mise en bouche, literally translated, it means to put in one's mouth. But it means sort of like to prepare your palate, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was a good uh, palate preparation for Death Con. <laughs> it was. It was awesome though. That was that was my favorite. Um, that was my favorite conference I'd been to, like crypto, like or blockchain oriented conference I think ever. Um, that was really cool. What did you like so much about it? 
Great vibe. Um, yeah. Lots and lots of diverse projects. Everyone was doing good stuff. No sponsorships. You know, very little shilling. Uh, I thought it was awesome. And because DevCon is so huge and so Ethereum focused, we need an alternative that gives other projects and platforms a place to um, kind of interact and kind of show their wares. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's hopefully what the Web3 Summit will evolve into. Yeah, it was terrific. Uh, like, obviously, like the venue was just amazing. It was a, this place called Funk House in Berlin. And it's like the former... Um, it's the uh, radio. It's radio. Yeah, I mean, you can probably explain this better. But, it's yeah. the GDR radio bro broadcasting station. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's it's like these big studios where they, you know I, I guess now have like uh, music events and things like that. So like the acoustics are just wonderful and the place is really beautiful. And I mean it's sort of outside Berlin, but getting there uh, was worth the trip. Um, but yeah, it it it. it, it there was no shilling. Everybody there was just really interested in the tech. Um, there were like some breakout sessions and workshops, no sponsors. Um, so I, I really like this type of event. Uh, in the same sort of vein, uh, like the, the, um, the DACON uh, event that you guys had a few months ago in, uh, in Berlin was also a great, also a great venue. I, mean, I feel like all the conferences I go to in Berlin are just always amazing. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was like, one thing that I think uh, we can say is that um, the, the, the cold virus that it seems to be uh, very present here has a very good like proliferation strategy. It started at DEF CON uh, or at, at, at uh, Web3 and now it's here. Everybody has a cold and now it will spread to all of the other places where these people are going to afterwards. And oh, that'll no. be the death of us all That's, by cold. That's yeah. one lucky cold. It's, yeah, I mean, it's got a really like good forking strategy. Who was yeah. patient zero? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. Maybe it started in San Francisco. Um, but I mean, it'll be interesting to see. What's that supposed to mean? I mean, because, because of San Francisco blockchain. Before. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that event evolves. Uh, maybe in four years it'll be like as big as this, right? Yeah. And we'll have like Web three uh, in Cancun. Who knows? <laughs> Please not. <in> <laughs> but I, th I hope so. Like, I think I thought that was amazing. Oh, that, was, yeah. that was really exciting. And just oh, also like Substrate is really exciting. Like, yes. I mean, I I have to confess that I've ne I've always been a little bit skeptical of the polka dot, like the parody model with like, you know, the, the notion of substrate as this like um, system for building a bunch of, um, a bunch of kind of chains that can pull security and then polka dot as something that can connect mm. those chains mm -hmm. and then connect with the rest of the ecosystem. Something about that, I just hasn't it gelled with me on a deep level, but at the same time, it sounds pretty good. It sounds really plausible. The notion of, um, the notion of application specific hardware, I think, um, kind of is a good parallel with like, application specific blockchains. Um, and so, yeah, I think, uh, and to see how, like also like the um, parity is such an amazing engineering team. I'm really interested to see how that evolves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and of course, uh, yeah, just our Gavin episode came out, so we spoke oh. with him for like an hour and a half about this. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that seems really cool. But yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. yeah, you should watch it. Yeah, it was really great. Uh, and yeah, the Substrate demo was, you know, uh, demo is always risky, right? But that that one uh, was definitely well done. It yeah, well. there were some moments there we weren't sure they were going to pull it <laughs> off. You know, some guy had to come with like a, you know, Wi-Fi hotspot to get the internet to work, everything. But yeah, he pulled it off. Um, yeah. yeah, so check out that episode. I haven't actually listened to it yet. It just came out yesterday when we were recording this. Uh, but yeah, de definitely check it out. It's last week's episode. Um, yeah, it's been, how long are we recording here? 55 minutes. Yeah, I think we can safely call this uh, a successful DEF CON wrap up uh, episode. What are you guys up to now? What's next? Um, I'm going to go to a Binance dinner. Um, and then I'm going to go to... Um, uh, Italy, um, Ukraine, Slovenia, uh, and then back to um, back to London for some more events, and then um, uh, you're oh, plowing my, through the end of the year. Yeah, I'm still going. And then, <laughs> oh, my brother had a kid, so then after that, I'm going to um, I'm going to Maine. I'm going to see the family. Oh, nice. Yep. And then when uh, will you be in Maine? Pardon? When will you be in Maine? Um, that'll be maybe the twentieth. I'll probably go there. Ah, 
I'll be right next to you then. Really? Where else? I'll be in New Brunswick. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll yeah. see each other there. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> Let's meet in Bangor. <laughs> sure. If I can plow through the snow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to not doing any more blockchain conferences this year, except for uh, the Hyperledger conference uh, in December, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to. But, that's, but until then, nothing. And after that, nothing. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, yeah, um, just uh, doing uh, something else than mingling. Uh, I saw it's Brian Bellendorf walking around today, actually. I have not seen him. I've been wanting to see, see him. I've not seen him. Uh, yeah. And uh, any anything exciting coming up for you? Nothing at all. I just need to get back to work to Berlin. But I think that's a lot of us. I think we all need to get back to work. And Brian? Yeah, the same thing. I also look forward to no more blockchain conferences <laughs> this year. <laughs> and yeah, otherwise getting back to work. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, get back to work. <laughs> um, so thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.